and I think we should get going. And if other people want to join us, they are most welcome and they can. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, where are we? Not that financial report, this power, this presentation. Let's have a look at it. Um, and I mean, basically for me, the question is our conference is changing. And that can be deconstructed in lots of ways. It can be de de deconstructed in ways like, you know, um, why should conferences change? Are face-to-face -face conferences changing? Are online conferences changing? Are online conferences changing conferences? Will online conferences die after the pandemic? Um, and, you know, this is 2020, which is the year of the online conference. So I'm just going to get this into present mode. Um, assuming you, you, you can see this currently, great. And now um, what we have here is a map of the world. So if you can actually use the annotation rights that you have, use the annotate menu and maybe find yourself a little um, stamp, it could be a heart, a, a tick, whatever it is, and mark where you are in the world on this map. So I'll mark that I am here. Okay, we've got something coming up in Kenya. We got, um, Jerome pointing an arrow to Nigeria. So if you can take, use the annotation options. Okay. Oh, wow. Um, Tunisia, Algeria, more South Africans coming up. Uh, how okay, do you so, get the annotation? Okay, at the top of your screen, there should be, you should be able to find your Zoom menu and one of those menus will include the, um, the more should give you some annotation. Okay. Oh, or the annotate, this, there definitely will be an, a little pencil to annotate on that menu for you, because I've enabled annotation for everybody. Okay, so you've got Niger and Denmark. Wow. Okay, <laughs> Jakob's pointing to Denmark. We have somebody in Turkey here as well. Okay, we have Zambia. We have more, lots of South Africa. Okay. Well, let's say is marking up Nigeria as well. I see. Nokutula is, where is Nokutula? This is interesting. Nokutula apparently is somewhere around Myanmar in a line between the Indian Ocean and Myanmar. Okay. And we have an arrow pointing to Eswatini. Derek Moore. Derek Moore is coming as well. Welcome, Derek Moore. Wow. What an assortment of peoples we have here. Okay, so it looks like most people are in, um, in different parts of Africa, South Africa, Zambia, Algeria, Eswatini, Kenya. Um, and we have an arrow pointing to Turkey. We have an arrow pointing to Denmark as well. So thank you very much, everybody. And we have lines in the middle of the Indian Ocean. So maybe Tula is on a cruise somewhere. I hope not. These cruises are not very good for COVID-19. OK. So what I'm going to do now as a precautionary measure is to disable annotation for others, because otherwise I learned a lesson in a previous event where people annotated over all of my slides. And let's see if it, the annotation continues here. Um, maybe I should just stop share and re re renew the share. Maybe that's the best, the safest thing to do. Okay, let's go back there and renew the share. And we're gonna continue. Okay, so a question for everybody is how are you doing after the first 5,000 years of the pandemic? Why do I say this? It's because when I was growing up, people always told me, and I don't know if they told you the same thing, that every year as you grow older, the years feel shorter. I must be getting younger. 
because 2020 feels like a really, really long year. And I don't know if you have a similar experience. So I'm going to ask you in the text chat, if you can enter in the text box, but not send it yet, how you feel after the first 5,000 years of the pandemic is. And wait, and I'll tell you to go in a, maybe a few seconds. So how I feel after the first 5,000 years of the pandemic is, if you can enter that in the text chat. Okay, three, two, one, go. Please send your message. Exhausted, happy, thankful, hopeful. Leave started, phew, Karina. Okay, any other messages about how you feel? Exhausted, exhausted, rejuvenated together, tired. This has been a rather tiring year. Thankful, you have got through this year almost completely. Surviving, and for a lot of people, this year has been about surviving at many different levels. And Joyce is connected. Thank you for connecting with us, Joyce. If you want to send another message, anybody, you're welcome to do so. Um, so that's the first 5,000 years of the pandemic. And it's not over yet, folks. It's going to continue for a while yet. OK, and now what I've decided to do is to start using and playing with a tool called Slido which has functionality very similar to Mentimeter and which I think has a much better free deal than Mentimeter does. So you can start using it at no cost to yourself, very usefully for meetings. Um, and, you know, it's an experiment for me. Um, so let's see how it works. You would need to go to slido.com and enter C372 to access what's happening for our meeting. Um, so have a go and see if you can get there and see if it works for you. And then the question, first question is how many online conferences have you been to this year? Ranging from zero through to more than 30. How many have you actually been to this year? So if you can go to slido.com, use that code C372. So one to five so far. One person, haha, a hundred percent. One to five is winning. Okay, so we're getting some people going to 11 to 20, more answers coming in. Let's give it a minute or two for your answers to come in. Wow. 11 to 20 are winning at the moment. Let's get a few more answers. We had six people so far. There are a lot of us in the room. Okay, so Karen is more than 20, very busy on other, other screens. Okay, <laughs> thank you for parallel processing with us, Karen. Okay, seven, eight, eight people here so far. And one to five is still winning. Okay. Nobody so far has been to zero con online conferences of the eight who've answered. And let's see a few more for slido.com. Yeah, I mean, not talking about webinars here. Webinars are just short events. I'm talking about something longer like a conference. And we're not talking about conference calls either. These are conferences. Okay, and so far, most people, the, the biggest group have been to one to five. But let's give it another minute or so because only 11 people have answered so far. I, I okay. do not know where to go to this slido.com. What? Jerome? Yes. You haven't been able to get in? I do not know where to go to, the, to get to this slido.com. Web browser, enter in your browser the address slido.com. Okay. That should then, do it. Then okay. it will ask for the code C372 for the event code. And Ralit says in the waiting room, somebody's in, um, hopefully in admitted her that's good okay so it looks like this is a year when 64 percent of the people in this room who answered Karen we don't want madness please we have enough madness already um one to five 
27 percent, 6 to 10, 9 percent, 11 to 20. And one person would have answered more than 30. OK, I think that's very interesting, given that we're talking about online conferences and that this has been the year of the online conference in so many ways. Let's move on. The next question again at Slido, and you can enter text for this. What was your favorite online conference of 2020? And Karen, you can answer in the text chat if you wish to, but everyone else, please come to Slido and go on to the next item. Your favorite, which one was the best for you? Your favorite online conference of this year? And I mean, most people have been to few enough online, online conferences that you should be able to remember. Wow, TLC 2020, Evidence 2020, so far coming up. Let's hear a few more. Your favorite one. The one that was best for you. AAU Diaspora Homecoming, wow. No, Facilitating Online is of course not a conference. Sorry, doesn't count as a conference. Network Learning Conference, Open Education Conference, OER 20. That's a lot of stuff coming up here. Okay. Digital 2020. The current one I am in. You are not in an online conference. Oh, but if you are in another a conference, please name it for us. Oh, the one you are in is always your favorite one. Now I understand. Learning Technology Summer Forum. Evidence 2020. Okay, a lot coming up. A lot of different conferences that people liked. Okay. And let's see one or two more. It's probably all the answers we're going to get. Okay, so current says digital 2020. Earlier and later today, teaching life writing. Current, you're one of these people like our comrade and friend Mahabali, who is in online conferences almost every day. So um, a different end of the range. Next Einstein Forum 2020 with the Ames Conference. That's right. So a lot of stuff going on here. Okay, thank you very much. Good to see the range of conferences and what you regard as your favorite. Okay. On the 10th of March, 2020, I went to my last face-to-face -face conference of the year, and I did a little provocation piece called Saying Goodbye to Face-to-Face -face Conferences. And I didn't realize, I knew something was coming up, I knew we'd have some kind of lockdown, but I didn't realize how prescient that would be for the whole of 2020. I was trying to get people to say goodbye to face-to-face -face conferences. Okay, so what we have here is a situation where, to quote Nina and colleagues, the forcing hand of COVID-19 has opened an opportunity to trial online formats and to reinvent conferences as a core institution of research and practice. And indeed, um, we can say that conferences are a core institution of academic culture and academic networks. Um, absolutely fundamental to the work done by researchers and practitioners who are trying to get their information and their results out and trying to find out what's new in the field. But if you think about conference design in general, um, we have a quote from Raven and Ellsberg while there's been exp extensive experimentation pretty much everywhere else in the educational world, the conference seen as a forum for learning still pegs the learner in the role of passive receiver of information. And I think that a lot of conferences face to face and online are still like that. And that the fundamental problems that we might have with online conference design are in common with those with face to face conference design. And um, Betty Collis in 2009 um, made a similar observation that online conferences are generally quite badly designed as learning events. 
So let's go back to the core of um, conference design. Mill in 1970 referred to a counterculture environmental conference, which was much more like a festival as well as a conference, um, a loose schedule, participants dropping in and out of events, rock bands, experiential activities. Participants who said speakers must come down from the stage to talk with us. You have the rise of the unconference in the late 2000s, um, which basically are a combination of the best parts of a conference, face-to-face -face dis discussions generating new ideas, passionate debates, genuine information exchange, but generally without the PowerPoint and with participants deciding what is going to be discussed. We have Seegers writing about participatory conferences. Um, we have lots of new formats and processes. We have the writing by McCandless and Lipmanovich and many others about liberating structures. And we have the work that went on about having immersive conference environments. So if you look at um, searches about innovative formats, you find processes like campfire sessions, birds of a feather, human spectro spectrogram, lightning talks, pecha kucha, world cafe, storytelling, brain dates. And an article by De Palma and Hoffman um, talks about innovations to create immersive environments, like an app to make a whole city feel like an event venue, a supercomputer involved in a public debate, a YouTube ukulele star who taught a class for attendees, and so on. Okay, so this is the kind of stuff that happens in a lot of innovative face-to-face -face conferences. And generally in face-to-face -face conference design, there are a number of delicate balances that need to be maintained. And those balances for face-to-face -face conference design include the balance between the formal and the informal, the balance between presentation, the one-way stuff and the learning conversations, the balance between individual experiences and what happens in temporary conference learning communities. Okay, moving on to online conferences, we have a um, definition from Anderson and Anderson who have written one of the very few books about online conferences that isn't um, just about the basics of how to, although they do a lot of that in that book as well. Structured, time delineated, professional education event, organized and attended on the internet by a distributed population of presenters and participants. Synchronous and asynchronous interaction. The thing to remember here is that even though 2020 is the year of the online conference, online conferences were not invented in 2020. Um, and this question about remediation, how online communication facilitates reshaping or remediation of the notion of the conference is not a new one because online conferences started even in the 80s. Um, in the 80s, we had Lisa Kimball reporting of an 84 online conference which occurred through mainframe computers where participants took part by using dial-in modems over the phone lines. Another early model was the email-based online conference um, exemplified by the work of Terry Anderson in 92 for people who could not physically make um, the online distance education conference um, and so he ran a conference of email. And what's happened since then has been a lot more bandwidth, a lot more processing power available most places, um, a shift towards conferences that try to replicate the face-to-face -face conference, that try to make things as much like a face-to-face -face conference as possible over a few days, um, and a trend towards face-to-face -face conferences going hybrid. But in that shift towards 
replicating face-to-face -face conferences. As a result of having access to more bandwidth, there's also a possibility of reproducing the kind of attitude and energy shown by many participants in the photo on the current slide. Um, that there isn't a real remediating. And many of the conferences I've seen this year, I haven't really seen a serious attempt to remediate the notion of the conference. Um, yeah. So an example of an online conference that I've been involved with and many of the people here have been involved with is the Emerge online conferences with two, with a number of core design principles. One has been social design and facilitation. We're part of a human community and we recognize that and work with that right from the start. The second one has been allowing space and opportunity for reflection. Third one, multiple modes of engagement. Some people can handle pretty advanced technologies that use a lot of bandwidth. Other people need to work with technologies that use very much less bandwidth. And then customization of a well-featured stable technology platform. And that's shifted and changed over the years. So whichever one that was at the time. Design elements have included the link between the global and the African context. Having something which is simultaneously conference and festival. Using synchronous and asynchronous engagement to allow for people to flex according to their schedules and according to the bandwidth and technology available to them. Having lots of space for informal interaction. Having space for participants to initiate their own interactions and questions. So you can be on the schedule or you can have an open space where you start your own topic. And then to have some interactions occurring in the social media, not just in the conference, whether it's in Facebook or in Twitter or a combination. And of course, using some tools that are advanced and which will allow space for um, people with the bandwidth and with the appetite to explore and using much more basic tools for the bulk of the interaction to not exclude people. And then we face the, the question of whether online conferences are actually changing conferences. It is clear that face-to-face -face conferences have a massive carbon footprint, particularly if they're global conferences or national conferences. So um, we're reducing the carbon footprint of, this, of these conferences by taking them entirely online. And then it also makes it possible for people to save on their um, travel costs and accommodation costs, but you're still at home and at work. And with all of the online conferences that have been available this year, and there have been hundreds of them and probably dozens relevant to our work, it's not surprising that many people here have taken part in relatively so few online conferences because life and work continue. Okay. And then, of course, the informal networking issues. What happens to informal networking? Um, how do you make that happen in an online conference? In many online conferences, the opportunities for in informal networking are seriously impoverished. And of course, our brains are being massacred by Zoom and by teams, um, too much screen time. Um, and we have the phenomenon of Zoom or Teams fatigue. And too many conferences have been using relentless Zoom and particularly Zoom webinar, which is even worse for a sense of community. Okay, so this year what we've seen is the emergency remote conference, a lot. And it started um, with the particle physics March meeting, which was canceled. This is a screen grab grab from Science Magazine the 1st of March. The March meeting is canceled due to COVID-19. And this is a time when many of the delegates had already arrived in Denver, Colorado, and people would be encouraged not to go there. So what's going to happen? 
So what happened was that the participants got together and self-organized and used free and low-cost services to set up their own substitute for the March meeting. By the time of the April meeting, they had the process worked out and they ran the meeting with 7,000 participants run across hubs in six continents. Okay, so I've gone a bit ahead here. Let me just go back. It's all right, I'll stay there for the time being. Okay, but this was not necessarily a fair example because physicists are used to self-organizing, have lots of experience of online conferences and collaboration. CERN's been involved in online conferencing since 2002. But the basics of emergency remote conferences are to focus on core processes, use available and no or low cost tools and to move fast. Okay, and there've been a lot of other um, conferences that have happened online this year. The best ones come from people who've actually got experience with online conferences and have done a lot of that in the past. Okay. And the 2020 articles and reports that I've read have repeatedly referred to informal communication and networking as being one of the problems, one of the gaps in online conferences. But what we're seeing is that this is being addressed in lots of different ways. So for example, we have Song et al talking about um, the importance of support for informal conversations that happen around the edges of in-person meetings and developing a tool called Mingler to do so. We have a tool called Kiko Chat, which has been around for a while, that provides a social wrapper around Zoom meetings so participants can move themselves in and out of different Zoom breakout spaces and use the connection with a Google Doc or another tool. And there are lots of commercial systems that have started using spatial metaphors to support group and paired interactions. So you have, for example, you have Remo, um, which has got, this is Mingler, you have Remo, which has got um, virtual rooms and furniture, you have spatial chat, you have Wonder, where you access audio and video communication through proximity with avatars of other participants. And you have another environment called Hopin, which supports group engagement and can, can scale up to hundreds of thousands of participants. Yeah, and most of these environments are priced for commercial clients, but at the low end, things um, are not necessarily prohibitive for a conference for, for an organization. Okay, so let's look at examples of a few conferences I've been to this year. So one example is a local conference, the UCT Teaching and Learning Conference, which went online for the first time in 2020. Um, we, we had months to do the conceptual planning and we tried to find dates eventually we worked around the unstable university calendar, found the dates. We had less, less than a month from the call for the abstracts to pull the conference together. And we leveraged the advantage that most members of our team had been involved in one or more of the eMERGE conferences. Some were trained as online facilitators. We had Zoom licenses. We had a very adaptable um, Sakai LMS installation. And we reused the Sakai site template developed for the Emerge 2018 online conference. Um, and Kath Fortune did a lot of adaptation of that and worked with that. And we found that our very local conference went international simply because it was online. Um, yeah, um, we didn't push for that, but we have enthusiastic tweeters in our team and it just went, didn't go viral, but it attracted people from many different countries. And our design included acknowledgement that people have been through a very challenging time with emergency remote teaching. There were workshops about finding personal and collective sustainability, about rethinking purpose. We had the jazz art chair movement activity for two mornings before the main plenary. There were escape room style puzzles. Okay, but after 18 years, this was um, the first time all of the experience in our Emerge team got used to design an online conference for University of Cape Town. 
Okay, so this was a local event that somehow went international. And then a participant driven event, the Future of Work 24 hour global gathering, which involved 216 enthusiastic participants across the world in an open space event about the future of work. At the start of each three and a half hour session, participants would meet and nominate and schedule topics. Um, and then could move between topics as you do in open space. Um, there were rooms for focused conversation. There's also a butterfly garden for mingling, a groundhog burrow for solitude with calm music. And then after each three and a half hour session, there was a share out of about 30 minutes. And really this um, was a testament to the experience and the deep social connections of people in the open space community as well. A really good example. Um, a small conference, but deep and productive. And then a mega event, the Embodiment Conference held over 10 days in October, hundreds of Zoom events led by um, embodiment practitioners right across the world. Just checking my timing, not too bad. Um, 480,000 registered participants. At last I checked over 200,000 people logged in. 60 paid staff, 200 volunteer, volunteers, a budget of a million dollars. They mostly use Zoom webinar, but you know, the presenters would sometimes bring some people into the panel space with them so they could see other human beings. Um, but they had a Facebook group for more personal conversations, 40,000 members though, local Facebook groups and small coffee break sessions to make it a lot more personal. So they were able to simultaneously scale up and scale down. And talking about scaling up, um, today on my Twitter feed, there was this tweet from George Siemens, who talked about a conference in China, which has over 20,000 universities registered and over a million conference attendees. And you'll see the name of the conference at the bottom of the screen grab of that tweet. So even in our kind of field, it is possible to scale up. Why you'd want to scale up that massive, I'm not sure, but it is possible. And here we have um, a comment from a person with a disability about that rapid move to online conferences. Abled people, we can't do remote conferences, it's so hard. Disabled people, it's not that hard, just try. Able people know the complexity, the cost, the problems. Able, disabled people, just try. Coronavirus says hello, and able people say, we are pleased to announce our new remote conferencing system. So suddenly things which we thought were too difficult become relatively easy because we have to do them. And then there's a question that arises, which is, will online conferences die after this pandemic? Um, I think we're in an era of pandemics. When this one um, ends, at some point, there's going to be another one. So we need to be prepared for things to go a little bit weird, sometimes for months or a year or two at a time. And of course, we're used to saving the cost of travel. So there's a certain attraction to and familiarity with online conferences that wasn't there before. But I wonder if you're longing for face-to-face -face conferences. I am sometimes really, really longing for the possibility of seeing people in the same room, eye contact in the same room, hearing people laughing or talking in the same room, um, sh shaking hands, the odd collegial hug. There is something so appealing about us with all our millions of years of social primate evolution about face-to-face -face contact and face-to-face -face conferences. But um, we certainly have the possibility of a more complex reality in the future. Ruas and others from a, an article this year say we see 
now either at virtual conferences or in-person meetings. But in the future, maybe we're looking towards hybrid online and in-person formats to reduce pressure for environmental and availability factors without impairing social networks. And I suspect that that's part of the way we're going. And I see a question from Pauline, which I'll pick up later, and a comment from Claudia about sharing coffee or a meal with people at a conference. And that is really part of the pleasure of the conference experience face to face. So now let's go back to Slido and I'm asking you a question. What will you do after the pandemic? Will you go, I've had, I've had online conferences. I am never going to go to another online conference or I will only attend online conferences because of carbon footprint, et cetera, and convenience. Or I will take part in face-to-face -face and online conferences. So, so far, never take part in, an, oh, I'll take part in both is winning, three, four. Let's see a few more. Couple more, slido.com, okay. Is this unanimous? Nobody on principle only going to attend online conferences. Where are your principles, folks? Okay, 10, all saying, I will take part in both face-to-face -face and online conferences. And I think probably that's the position that most people are going to adopt, the flexibility to take part in both face-to-face -face and online conferences. Okay, I'm not going to wait for any more responses. Okay, and Nicholas says cost and logistics permitting. I haven't kept looking at the questions that have come up, um, but let's pick up on a few comments and questions. Okay, so Irene's got a question. Can the description of online conferences change? Are there elements that are new? And be interesting to hear from anyone who thinks there are new elements. I suspect that in 2020, we haven't really seen radical innovation in the notion of online conferences, except in the more big organization and commercial spaces where people can afford the funky tools, um, which may or may not be quite as funky as they build. Okay. And then there's a comment from Nicola. It would be cool to have a curated list of tools used for online conferences, which are commercial and which are free. Um, I think there's a, a network around emergency re remote online facilitation um, in the States, which has started to build that kind of um, resource for tools for online facilitation, online community. Maybe that's something to tap into. And then there's a question from Pauline here as well. Pauline, the questions I'm talking about here and these activities are things which are in some cases accessible, even with fairly low end online environments but they're not necessarily things that we did. The butterfly garden was in the open space event. And um, there is no easy quantitative comparison here. You can't, there's no control group because these are different kinds of conferences as well. Um, but what we did find was surprising um, level of participation in our teaching and learning conference at UCT, despite the fact that people were, essentially ERT fatigued and also um, preparing for the next term while in some cases trying to take a few days of holiday as well. So a lot going on there. So dear colleagues, maybe um, if you want to put questions into the chat um, and maybe I can stop sharing for the time being as well and see everybody. Um, and maybe somebody wants to raise a hand and ask for the mic. And certainly we have Jerome. Jerome, please take the mic. Thanks, Tony. That was very interesting. I find 
the kinds of meetings we hold, like what we're holding now, very interactive with all these innovations that you do to take us to Slido or whichever, uh, many things mm -hmm. at the time. But this is not typical of what we experience in online conferences. <laughs> yeah, so. Yeah. So. so you uh, I'm talking and talking until you, you switch off really, you're connected, but you switch off. That is what really happened. Indeed. But, but that's not the, the main comment I want to make. The main comment is that online conferences, if well done, have so many advantages. Uh, all, some of them you, you highlighted, uh, no travel costs and no travel risks uh, and accommodation and so on and so on. But we also miss out on the human interaction. And when we talk about contextualizing it, in Nigeria, because I can't talk about Africa, I don't know so much about Africa. But in Nigeria, those of us in public institutions, uh, we are hardly uh, sponsored for conferences. Now there's the, the Education Trust Fund uh, that sends a little amount of money to universities, but you cannot get that fund, if at all, if you said you were going to attend an online conference. You have to give cost of, of ticket, cost of everything and accommodation and so on and so on, because it's a form designed like that. Yeah. And then, um, yes, and then there's the, the, just one more second. Then there is yeah. also the, the freshness of changing environment, which online conferences don't afford you. Well, yes, I get all the points that you're asking, raising, Jerome. Thank you very much. That's that's very helpful. I get your point about the fact that most online meetings and conferences are very badly designed and designed for listening, 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 listening all the time. Um, and the funding issues, you're going to have to re-educate that fund. You're going to have to get the um, all the um, public servants associations to get that fund to change its mind um, because the cost of going to online to face-to-face -face conferences itself is problematic um, so obviously there are some things that need to change in the environment and there are people who are working so old school they don't recognize online conferences can even exist or be useful maybe it would be good to get some of the fund decision makers into a good online conference and see how they change their minds I'm afraid I don't have any more to offer than that at the moment. Um, yes, um, and there's a quick, uh, Nicola's also posted, um, oh, Gabriel's posted, you know, that the idea of an online conference by email sounds crazy, but in the 1980s and the early 90s, it made absolute sense. Nicola, that combination of Telegram as an organizing space and using that as a hub to send people to Zoom. There are just so many different ways that people have organized this year. Um, let's see, anyone else want the hand? Karina, um, please take the mic. Um, thanks, Tony. So I'm really interested in, in the design of, of future conferences, these hybrid conferences. Hmm. Um, when we did um, a hybrid conference two years ago, it was very much actually the online component was an add-on um, and it was actually just opening up the physical event via live streaming um, and it's not the kind of conference where you have real engagement socialization networking connections all of those things so i'm wondering if you've seen anything um, where you actually have hybrid conferences but where you have full integration of online and physical where the one is not the norm and the other one kind of just get added to, but that there's an actual real um, integration of the two kinds of formats. Well, um, Karina, thank you for that. I think what you're describing is the lowest level of hybridity where you're just streaming out and you're not actually accepting that the people outside can be inside the conference in some way, even while virtual. Um, 
And it is not easy to get it right because you need an integrated design that takes the virtual as seriously as the face-to-face. -face. And I think we started to see little glimmers of that in our Emerge 2018, when we had two local hubs at Nigerian universities, one of which was um, organized by Jerome Duga, another by Ayotela um, Aremu, I think she was Ibadan, and they had interaction occurring face to face where they were, um, and were participating in this kind of um, mix up, which included sometimes even dipping into a conference in Kampala, um, organized by Mac Macarere University which occurred, occurred at the same, in the same time frame as the Emerge conference was happening. So you need to actually have face-to-face -face and online um, having equal importance in your design considerations. It is not easy to get it right. Um, I've also heard of um, courses um, which do the hybrid and have been experimenting with the hybrid for years, like the courses run by um, Etienne and Bev Wenger Trainer about social learning issues and value creation in networks. And they've done a lot of work about running hybrid courses as well over the last several years. But yes, I need to find better examples. Of course, this year we're not going to find examples of hybrid conferences. Um, and next year, we're hoping that there'll be a need to design lots of hybrid conferences, particularly in the second half of the year. Karina, let's continue that conversation. Okay, um, and I'm just trying to look and see. Um, Claudia asking a question about the cost components of online conferences. And um, I think this is a very important question for an organization that probably this year is funding a lot of online conferences. And I think there are, there is the question of the technology platform being used, whether there are particular licensing costs, whether there are um, actual programming costs, whether they're customization costs and setup costs, interface modification costs particularly. So that's at the tech, tech end, but then there are also um, issues around the cost of the human time involved in organizing, designing, um, and facilitating the conference. I think these online conferences work best when they use stable, um, already in use and paid for, and adaptable technology platforms. Um, because then you're basically saying we're not paying a commercial provider for some funky online um, conference platform when we have tools that we can reuse and adapt. And we're very fortunate at the University of Cape Town with the Sakai online learning environment, which you call Vula, which has enough tools built in that it is relatively easily customizable to use for online conferences as well in partnership with a synchronous environment um, like Adobe Connect in the past and currently Zoom and other people might use other environments as well. Um, so that's my sense of some of the major cost facility, cost components. And yeah, Nicola's right. Facilitation and planning are um, actually the major costs once you're actually using technology you've already got. And Irene's asking a question, some online conferences are charging a lot to participate. What would that be attributable to? And I think what happens here is that there are a lot of conferences that are the major fund generation activity for scholarly associations. And you can understand why they may charge a lot to participate because they're trying to run their whole organization on revenue raised from the conference. 
Um, in some cases, you're talking about conferences which have a very high cost base because of their scale and the number of organizers and facilitators and tech support people and the kind of tech platforms that they are using. So those may also be an issue. Um, but there are ways to um, tweak that cost base to make things more affordable. And of course, across Africa, most people who would want to go to conferences in this space don't have the conference funding. Okay, um, and yeah, Nicola's referring to Heltasa, our local teaching and learning conference in South Africa, charging 500 Rand for participants, which is probably somewhere around $30 at current exchange rates. Okay. Right, design is an important issue is coming up here as well. Dear colleagues, we are getting close to the end of the time we have together. So what I'd like to do is to move into some closing activity um, and to really say thank you to all of you and thank you to um, our co-hosts, Jakob and Irene for holding things together in very important ways. So let's go back to the share screen and see what we do with that. Okay, so we've had our discussion time. Um, a little commercial plug for the facilitating online course, where, which we're going to be running four times, planning to run four times next year. And where there is a short URL, bit.ly slash facilitate21. So you can take down that URL um, if you want to have um, access to the information and you haven't seen it yet. And I'm ask, wondering if somebody could put that into the text chat as well. That would be very helpful. Somebody in the Emerge team, please. The bit.ly slash facilitate21. Thank you. Okay, and so we've got a closing question here, which is going to be in the text chat as well, which is what are you walking away with from this little meeting about online conferences? If you can put your message into the text box, text box and wait until I say go, what are you walking away with? And hopefully you're going to walk away from the screen and go do something else not just look at the screen for another few hours. What are you walking away with? If you can answer in the text chat um, and just wait. Okay, what you're walking away with, three, two, one, go. Blended conference participation reflections, design for engagement, changing conferences, Any others? Still a few people in the room, apparently. Social, not enough there yet. Absolutely right, Claudia. Adaptability, designing for equity, diversity, and inclusion, really important. Attending web conferences while picking up kids from school, etc. Too much parallel processing, Derek. A bit more hybridity as the way forward. I'm not sure everything is possible. Many things are possible though, absolutely. New perspectives. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mutomi. Okay. And if you need to contact us, yes, we have info at emergeafrica.net. Um, we have emergeafrica.net as our main website. And from that, you can join the email group if you're not a member yet, or link through to our Facebook group. Find out information about what's coming up with Emerge Africa. If it wasn't for online conferences, absolutely right, Gabriella. And it is time efficient. Thanks, Roger. And I just want to say, Thank you very much to everybody who's been part and is still here. Thanks for sticking around, for taking part. Um, and I would ask if you have the bandwidth to do it, um, I'd encourage you to 
switch on your camera and we can wave at each other across Africa and the world. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, bye. Okay, looking forward to seeing you more in the future and wishing you a wonderful end to 2020. Congratulations on surviving and sometimes even thriving. Thank Thanks you all. Yes. Cheers. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Okay.